Well, blessed Tuesday to you as we come with your daily encouragement. And yesterday we talked about the the test of the false prophet, the Antichrist, or the the one who is trying to lure people away. Now, the two things that they're trying to lure people to is to worship the um, the Antichrist, the second beast, but more importantly, the second beast wants you to worship the first beast, which is the government structure of Rome. And that has been the oppressor in um, both Judaism and in Christianity, and that has been what it has been against. And it thinks that if you want to worship it, it will give you power. And so in verse uh, 14, uh, we talked about um, chapter uh, 13, 13 yesterday. Now we're talking about chapter 13, 14. And by signs that it is allowed to perform on behalf of the beast, it deceives the inhabitants of the earth. Now it performs signs on behalf of the beast. Once again, we have a model, I believe, of Rome. Whether it actually happened in Rome or it is yet to happen in a Rome-like government, that's up to the interpretation. But the key thing is, is that this second beast is a person, a ruler, who wants you to worship the first beast, the government structure. And you see, Rome, in, you have Caesar, you have the government of Caesar. And both of them went hand in hand. And so the model here is of a Caesar person or a Caesar-like person. That's what I'm saying in the, in the epistles, they always talk about, we're not looking for just one Antichrist, we're looking for many who will try to deceive people away from the worship of the true God. And so that's where you can have some openness of interpretation. This is to give you a construct of what you are to do and what you are not to do. So with that in mind, let's look at verse 14. It says, The signs that it is allowed the second beast to perform on behalf of the beast, the government. So the Antichrist is wanting you to worship the government of this other beast. Once again, it's most likely Caesar and Rome. They go together. It deceives the inhabitants of the earth. Now, is it all of the earth? Maybe. Or is it the Mediterranean um, area that Rome was in charge of? Uh, Rome was in charge of most of the inhabited land. So once again, most people's worldview was centered on just the Mediterranean Sea at that time, and that Rome was the center of government. Now, it has expanded, so it could be all the earth. Once again, you know, Jesus calls us to preach the gospel to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So it is not uncommon for a, a Rome-like place to go out evangelizing the worship of a new government uh, that is contrary to God. Now, you can do all the applications of what you think it is, but that's the basic metaphor that is working here if you are just working with what was previous to what is future. So it says, and signs that will be allowed to perform on behalf of the beast to deceive the inhabitants of the earth, telling them to make an image of the beast that had been wounded by the sword and yet lived. Now, people who take this literally says that this second beast, this Antichrist, is going to die by the sword and rise again. Where have we seen that? Of course, we've seen that in earlier in the book of Revelation. It said the lamb who was slain is now on the throne. So we have a imitation going on. And that's what we've had throughout this chapter and throughout this second beast. It is one who was like a lamb, like a lamb, key word, and now has been slain and brought back to life like the lamb in Revelation 4. So we're talking about someone who is deliberately imitating Christ. Now, if we take this literally, it has to be a miracle. It has to be something that it cannot be explained um, by normal scientific means. It is something that shows that there is a supernatural power, although contrary to God, a supernatural power that is called to deceive people. Metaphor-wise, though, 
I will contend that governments, and this has been something that I've, I've read about in both anthropology and sociology, governments are always founded by battle. And of course, our, our nation, the, the United States, it was founded by the Revolutionary War. It was founded in blood, and so was Rome, too. Rome was founded by a great battles and battles that happen, and they bring people together. Politically, that's what people say. It's like, we need a good battle in order to bring people together. And of course, we have that going on in other places. I'll tell you, you know, I mean, Ukrainians may not may have had some kinship with Russia before the war, but now they, because of the battle, they are hardened to be their own thing and not Russian. So, I mean, you, you, there is a good example of how battles can harden things. The Palestinians and the Israelis, another one where because of their constant conflict, they can be in battle with each other. And I may make an observation with the battles that are going on right now with our political parties. There is some hardening of people saying, well, I'm not going to be like a Democrat or I'm not going to be like a Republican. People are kind of hardening their position. And what is it forming in? It's forming in battles used by the sword. And so those are things that sometimes a battle can be useful to galvanize people. And it will involve bloodshed and sometimes even driving people to the point of death or death. But we also know that new governments based on old ones can rise again. When I traveled the South, uh, sometimes to see my relatives, sometimes I'll always be amazed at how many Confederate flags are there. Why? Because... There was a pride, even though the Confederate side lost the war, there's still that South will rise again, will rise from the ashes, will, you know, I mean, so even dead political ideologies, and I hate to say that, you know, you see this with even the swastika and other things coming up, these dead political ideologies still have a life of its own, even when they're dead. That's why it calls for endurance and vigilance. You know, you can't just ignore it. I used to think that. It's like, well, I'm I'm never going to see a true Nazi. Well, maybe you will. You know, I'm never going to see a true Confederate. Well, maybe you will. You see, you don't know all these ideologies. They can rise up very quickly, and they're usually done by the sword. And so it is interesting that the sword yet lived. And the inhabitants of the earth telling them to make an image of that beast that had been wounded by the sword and yet lived. And so that's where people can define themselves. They can define themselves by their Facebook page or their Instagram account, by a lot of images that they put there. Or people with their patriotic images to say that they're loyal to America. Or they put the image of Christ, Christ the Lamb who was slain and rose again, making sure that that is the center image of their life. And so while these other images swirl around us, the greatest image that we need to keep in our minds, and it doesn't have to be having a cross around your neck or earrings or jewelry, it simply means that you have Jesus as the one that defines you and not these other images. Now, some can go along with that. I don't think there's anything wrong with flying a flag and being a Christian. But there is the thing, one will rule in eternity, and that is the Christian. The Christian, because they are onto something on a supernatural plane, a spiritual plane, not just an earthly plane. As Jesus was having his argument with Pilate, what did he say? My kingdom is not of this world. So whether you kill me or not, it's not going to matter. And in fact, he rose again to show that he is even more powerful than this. But the Antichrist in Revelation 13 is imitating that. So we can have our interesting interpretations about what happened in the past, what happens in the present, and what happens in the future. Let's not limit it to one thing. It can be many things, but there is only one Christ. God bless you today. We trust that these continue to be words of encouragement. Take care. God bless. We'll see you next time.